two weeks, we've been in Matthew 16, but we said there were parallel passages to Matthew 16 and, and Luke and Mark. And if you were to read either one of the parallel passages, that it would be quite clear. You, you couldn't miss the fact that they were parallel passages. And I was talking about the new humanity in relationship to that. But John has his account, so to speak, in John 6, which is John's view. And at that point, it would have been an addition. He would have known what Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote. So he would have been writing, coming in from a different way to describe what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. And I thought it'd be kind of fun to look at John's approach to... I can't say, you know, what he felt they missed or anything, but just a different way of looking at it. And you got to appreciate that, I think, because it's sort of like whenever we look at anything, it could be today, being in this room, the time we spend together, there's different ways of looking at it, and there's different things that come out of it. There's always different ways of looking at it. Now, John is going to introduce us to the same event, and... You know it's the same event because he uses the feeding of the 5,000, which is in the other Matthew, Mark, and Luke as well. It's kind of like the feeding of the 5,000 marks the framework of time and the actual kind of event. So in John 6, uh, he opens with the feeding of the 5,000, which you know we're all familiar with. And then there's a segment about Jesus walking on water. And then there's a segment where Jesus identifies himself, his first I am, I am the bread of life. And then, there's, then he gets rejected, and then we finally get to Peter's revelation of, you know, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So that's all in John 6. So it does get kind of interesting because that thing in Matthew about, you know, get thee behind me, Satan, because you basically, you're an offense to me, that you don't care about the things of God, but the things of men, which is where we've been with the new humanity, the of man as opposed to the things of God and all that. And in Matthew, it's quite clear Jesus turns to Peter, but he's addressing Satan, is what he says. So there is a bit of a satanic involvement there, if you would, in this whole thing. In John, it's kind of interesting because he doesn't include that, get thee behind me, Satan. He doesn't include that part of it. What he does include was that Satan was already having an influence on Judas. So he still brings in the aspect of satanic influence in the moment, if you would, but not in the way that Matthew talks about it. Yeah, yeah, he was harassing you know, Peter for sure with the things of men, but he was already having to go at Judas as well. So you, you have to, you know, when we look at these things and, you know, some people couldn't care less, I, I realize that. But when I look at it, I look at it and I think, this is absolutely fascinating that we've got these four accounts that when you start to put them together and look at it, what was the Spirit of God actually saying? And it's kind of like, you know, Peter wasn't alone in terms of being influenced. John's making it clear Judas was already being influenced. It's going to happen ten chapters later where he's going to betray him and sell him out, but it was already happening back here. At the same time, when these different things were going on and people were walking away, and Judas said, I'm not going anywhere, but he was already being influenced. So it's kind of interesting to look at all that. We're not going to go way down that road. All I want to say is we've been talking, I've been trying to, in one way or another, address all of us as people of prayer and faith. And what that means, that in prayer, our lives of prayer, our whole life is a prayer. And it's in relationship to God and the things that come out of prayer. You know, we talk about God's will. His will is that we spend time with Him in prayer. Yes, and then we walk, whatever we kind of like receive in prayer, we walk out. That's our faith when we're walking it out, prayer and faith. And we've talked about that. So today, we're not going to do all of John 6 because it's like the longest chapter in John. It's 71 verses. We're not doing that. We are just going to take the feeding of the 5,000, which is one of those things that is recorded in all four Gospels and precedes, ultimately, Peter's revelation. Um, if somebody wants to read that, someone who likes to read, go ahead and read John 6, verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. 
A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that we may feed these? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise also of the fish as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Of men of God. This particular story, what Jesus did, you can't really miss the ofs, if you would, if you know what you're looking for. In other words, John starts by looking at this body of water that he says is the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. It's like, well, which is it? Yes, Herod Antipas actually renamed the Sea of Galilee after the Emperor Tiberius, the Roman Emperor, in the days of Jesus. It had been the Sea of Galilee since the days of Joshua, long time, Sea of Galilee, the place where the Jews live, where they worship, the whole thing. But now, Herod, who's basically become political, he's not a very good Jew, quite frankly, he renames the sea after the Emperor Tiberius to please him and makes it the capital of Galilee. So John is saying right from the bat, we have got this sea right here called Galilee. It's the same sea, but it has become Tiberius. We could look at America. I mean, I hear all these things about America as a Christian nation. Really? Really? Because we go to church on Sunday? Really? We can go down, I don't want to go down that road today, but what I am saying is that there is a huge difference between the birth of this country and the way they worshipped and why they moved here and everything else and the way the church and Christianity has worked its way out in America. And in a lot of days it looks a lot more like Tiberius than it looks like the Sea of Galilee. Let's put of men and of God. He also says that Jesus goes up on the mountain. And it's like, okay, I get this. Sermon on the Mount, he goes up. I get all the up on the mountain stuff. It's a reflection immediately of Jesus and his kingdom, the of God. And then he says, but the feast, the Passover, the feast of the Jews. Those of you who were here months ago when I said, you got to remember the Jews for John is a code. They're a nasty group of people. They're Jewish and they're a nasty group. And every time you see them in John, the Jews, they're always doing something and saying something nasty. This is not a compliment. He's not saying these are the wonderful Jewish people that have been circumcised. He's saying the Jews. So when he says the feast, you know, the Passover is near, the feast of the Jews, it's no longer of God. God gave them that feast, and it had tons of significance and meaning and celebration for coming out of Egypt. It's no longer that. It's become something else. It's the feast of the Jews that even Jesus doesn't want any part of, quite frankly, because it's become of men. Philip thinks of men. He doesn't even answer the question. Jesus is where? He doesn't answer the question. He just says, basically, even if we had this much money, we couldn't do anything about it. It's a real of men answer. It's not even hearing the word where. Andrew hears the word where and brings a kid with a lunch, which is another message in itself that someday we'll talk about, the way God uses lads, children. It's all through the Bible. It's easy to miss, though, because we go, oh, isn't that cute? Actually, no, no, it's not cute. It's actually God's way. When Jesus says stuff like, those who come to me like little children, I can do something with them. Because their heads aren't all stuffed. They're not worried about tomorrow. They're not holding on to their pocketbook. You know, all kinds of stuff. I can work with children. 
Ch children get a dollar. Here, here's a dollar. That's great. Another one will come along someday. I don't know, whatever. Here comes the lad with his lunch. Innocent little kid. Andrew, so at least Andrew's got the where part. He heard where, and he's, well, here's a little kid. But it's worthless because you can't do anything with it. It's not enough. It's still, he gets a hold of one part of the where, but it's still filled with, but what can we do with that? Look at how many people there are. Don't look up on the mountain. Look at all the people. Look, at it's too much. It's too vast. I'm not picking on the guys. It's just, it's a very clear of God and of man moment where you've got Jesus looking, because he's gone up. He's in a different state right now. He's of God. He's gone up. He's already in the place. In two chapters, he's going to identify himself as the good shepherd. <coughs> this chapter, I am the bread of life. Chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. Okay, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. There's something about being a good shepherd. Let me go back in my Bible and my brain. Ding, 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 ding. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, what does he make them to do? To lie down in green pastures. Make them lie down. Jesus is in the zone right now. He knows who he is, he knows who his father is, and he knows what he's going to do. That's what it says there. It's the same exact picture as Psalm 23. It means a vast field that you couldn't possibly exhaust the amount of pasture. That's what David is saying. That's who the Lord is. He's the good shepherd. He places us in these pastures that you can't exhaust. All who come to me shall never hunger or thirst. You're not going to be able, you don't care how much you stuff yourself. You're never going to be able to exhaust it. Make him to lie down in the green pasture because he knows what he's going to do. Because he's the good shepherd. And that's what the good shepherd does. He is not reliant on the thoughts of men, whether we think he can do it or not. That's, that's a non-issue for him. So, we see all this happening. In John 10, by the way, when he says he's the good shepherd, he also says, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. More abundantly, because at the end, oh, 12 basketfuls left over, which is ridiculous. Yeah. They started with a boy's lunch, you know, because we said, well, maybe the fish were like this. You know, it was a boy's <laughs> lunch, for crying out loud. They were probably fish like this, you know, a kid with five little fishes and two little hard rolls, basically. That's what he had. Boom! And they fed 5,000 people. And people have tried to get their heads around this. I've heard them all, believe me. More than I want to hear. Two things happen. You totally missed the spiritual message behind it. And number two, it did happen exactly as it happened and whatever. Life more abundantly. What do we got? 12 baskets full. We've got tons more than we started with. Yeah, because I give life more abundantly. The need that you have now, I give abundantly, like Ethan, I, I provide. And not just for today, but for many days ahead. Verse 14 is an of God moment where they identify him as something that's come from of God into the world of men, basically. But again, relative to what we've been saying about Peter's revelation, they got it, he's the prophet, but they don't know what that means. Over what we've been talking about is he leads them in this thing about suffering and death. But here, our story of the feeding just ends with what does that mean, basically? He's more than that prophet that Moses had prophesied about. But we'll start with that of God moment. Now today, all I want to do is talk about the word where and look at some where cues questions what I mean by that there's a lot we could say about the feeding I want to because we've been talking about of God and of men where are you going to go where that's a key word and it's all through the Bible I just took a few that you'd be familiar with maybe not so familiar with whatever but just some cues Way back in Genesis, when the man and the woman decide they've got a better idea than God, we know what happens with the woman at the tree, the serpent. We know the whole story. The result is God saying to Adam, where are you? And it wasn't because he didn't know where he was. We know that. 
where are you as a result of eating from that tree? We said a few weeks ago, I don't remember, just it came back to mind as I was doing this, the first in the New Testament, when the wise men come, they say, where is he? It's kind of like it's a funny book, the Bible. We start off with, where are you? And by the time we get to the beginning of the New Testament, it's like, I'm nowhere. Where is he? I need to see. I need to be saved. I need to get rid of the pain. I need to get rid of the fear. I need, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? It's kind of fun. That's one of the things that we all ask in situations that we wish were different. Where is he? Where is he? You know, this kind of thing. Now, that's that the wise men are saying, where is he? We want to worship him. Because we recognize that if we, if we had originally, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now. If we had kept and maintained the of God, we wouldn't be in the of men state over here that's a mess, a flipping mess in every conceivable way. But here in Genesis, it's where are you, Adam? In other words, Adam decided to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of man. He had the tree of life over here. He decides he'd rather operate out of the of man position. And as a result, the lie that he believed, the father of lies said to him, you know, has God said the whole thing. As a result, we know what happened. There's spiritual blindness. And in his world, separation from God, the whole thing. When we decide that we need knowledge more than the knowledge of good and evil, more than life, we're getting more and more blind. Where are you? You've committed yourself to the of man. It's a bad place to be. Our commitment needs to be the of God. The whole situation of the garden revolved around the fact that they felt that they needed to know something other than God himself. If you know God and God says, give the money away, give the stuff away for crying out loud, but it doesn't make any sense. Oh, so now you're a professor of good and evil, right? You know better. Just do what God says. If you know him, you'll also know that whatever he says to do, he's got something wild in the works. He always does. But if we don't take the first, so where are you? Where are you? If you ate from the wrong tree, the good news by the end of the chapter is I'm going to sort that out. You made a bad decision, but I'm going to sort it out. You'll never sort it out. In the next chapter, where is your brother Abel? One chapter, where are you? The next one is, where is your brother Abel? And that whole thing, John clarifies for us in his epistle, this was all about righteous and unrighteous works. That Cain kills his brother because his works were, his, Cain's works were unrighteous and his brothers were righteous. And so when he says, where is your brother? It's kind of like, I don't know and I don't give a rip. He shouldn't say, I don't know. He knew he had killed him. Where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? What's actually happening there? And again, if you don't know what you're looking for, sometimes it's hard to see and find. In the Hebrew, when it talks about Cain deciding to make an offering, the context in Hebrew is somebody at the end of their life who's dying. And so he decides it's a good time to make an offering. I mean, there's a lot of people that do that. There's deathbed confessions. There's people who all of a sudden, at the very end of their lives, they decide that they're gonna you know, hedge their bets now, if there is a God. You know, Cain, when we're looking at him, and by the way, he was, it says in John, he was impacted by the evil one again. He's always around, he's always influencing our thoughts, because he savors the things of men. He knows how to appeal to our minds, the way we look at things, and We've got Cain. The picture is one of him being at the end of his life and deciding it's about time to do something for God. We've got Abel, who's saying basically, I owe everything to God if he never did another thing for me. He's already done too much. He's given me life abundantly and I can't even get through it. Where is your brother? He's the one who decided to applaud God, not appease him. And this is challenging because we might, we might say stuff like, oh, wow, I, I never heard it quite that way. I don't really care. 
What I care about more is in our lives, where are we? Are we in the appeasing business? Well, God wants me to do need to. Or are we on a daily basis applauding Him with our very lives? Is it an expression of praise that applauds Him? Where is your brother Abel? In Genesis 18, where is your wife Sarah? Where are you? Where's your brother? Where's your wife? Genesis 17 and 18 is an interesting story. In Genesis 17, God talks to, who's still Abram, not Abraham yet. He changes his name and he tells him he wants to enter into a covenant with him. This is like the birth of the whole Jewish people with Abraham. The covenant, the circumcision, the whole thing. And he's very clear with Abraham that this is his way forward, circumcision, the whole thing. But he also repeats to him how he is going to make a nation out of Sarah. Now, at this point, they had already had the Ishmael, where Abraham went into his maidservant, the whole thing. So he's got an Ishmael, who's a teenager at this point. And God is saying, but I'm going to bring the promise through Sarah. That's what he says to him in 17. And basically what happens, it says that Abraham falls on his face and he laughs. And Abraham says to himself, am I going to have a child at 100 years old, which would have been a year later? Am I going to have a child at 100 years old? And my wife who's 90, is she going to you know, have a kid? This is a bit outside the box. And he's laughing about it. And God also changes Sarah, Sarai to Sarah. And by the way, that little ha, Abraham and Sarah, ah is the syllable that they use for saying the name of God. So it's like he's, he's injecting himself into Abram and in Sarah in their very name. From now on, when you are called, you are called of God. You are an of God thing now. You're not an of man. You're an of God, Abraham and Sarah. So you've got this, this thing happening. And... Abraham cries out to God, Oh, that you might bless Ishmael. Now remember, Ishmael is a work of the flesh. They did it on their own. This was an of man thing. Ishmael is an of man thing. Which all of a sudden, when you look at the Middle East now, mm -hmm. and you see everything that's going on in the Middle East are the generations of Ishmael and Isaac contending with each other, of man and of God. Make no bones about it. They can, they can politicize it all they want, Palestine, and you can go any, I don't care what, it is down the line of man and of God, and it's not hard to see the difference if you know what you're looking for. So, the way chapter 17 ends is Abraham appealing to God for a blessing on his son. And you can't blame the guy, it's his son. He screwed up and he's got this kid. But he's still, it's his son. It's a work of the flesh, though. But it's his son. So, God says, fine, I will bless him. But I'm telling you, the promise is coming through you and Sarah. So when we get to the next chapter, in chapter 18, we've got the three guys coming that are going to end up destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. But they visit Abraham and Sarah first. Abraham recognizes that they are the Lord appearing in these three as one, almost. You've got this picture, and they approach them, and Abraham's all, ex all excited because he recognizes it's the Lord. He wants to prepare a meal for him. So he says to Sarah, you know, do this, do that, get the bread ready. I'm going to get the calf and all that. And they're having this meal. It's in verse 9 where they ask, where is Sarah? Where is your wife, Sarah? And he says, she's in the tent. And they say, okay, well... You're going to have a baby. You're going to have a baby boy, whatever. You're going to have the promise, the whole thing. Verses 12 and 13. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? So who laughed? Sarah laughed in this right here. Sarah laughed. Mm -hmm. And who does God address? Kind of interesting, isn't it? She laughed, and you're talking to me. Yeah, I am. I'm asking you, why did she laugh? 
Abraham, this, is, this will be a good time to say, well, so did I the first time around. And to be honest with you, I might still be having a little laugh. <laughs> I laughed first. You know, she takes the rub there. In fact, for, in 1 Peter 3, it, it's amazing the way he talks about this episode. Again, you, you miss it if you don't put it together. But the Lord addresses Abraham and says, tell me, she's your wife. Why did she laugh? See, Abraham and, and Sarah are the father and mother of faith and grace. And it's not me making it up. In Romans 3 and 4, Abraham's identified as the father of faith. Over in Galatians 4, uh, Sarah's the one who represents grace. And what's basically happening here, the question, where is Sarah, is where is the grace? You see, your faith laughed at, at the promise of God. It became an of man moment. Is it possible for me to have a kid at this age? That's of man thinking. If God says you're going to have a kid, you're going to have a kid. Because that's where kids come from. But faith, the faith of Ab Abraham, he's more interested in the works of his flesh at that. He's laughing at God, at the promise, and more concerned about the work of his flesh, of man. And he carries that in, and all of a sudden, the work of faith can't really operate. Not, not, it's not an of God faith. It's a faith of man, not of God. And when it's that, then you cut off the grace. Where is grace? See, depending on our faith, how we work out our faith, depending on how it depends on how God works in his grace. You know, when Paul talks about by grace, you are saved through faith, not the other way around. You're not saved by grace through, or, or saved by faith through grace. It's the other way around. So the question is, where is it? We saw it. We're people of faith and prayer, or prayer and faith. No prayer, no faith. Deal with it. That's the way it works. You can go around all day long and read every Kenneth Copeland book you want. And if you're not spending time with God in that place, the of God place, then what's coming out is just another work that's saying, bless this works of my flesh. Bless, bless the works of, oh God, bless me, bless me, bless me. So we still have these of man, of God moments and stuff like that. And really what it is, is I'm playing at the faith game and there's no grace because I'm playing at the faith of men instead of the faith that comes out of with God. Now that faith, you can give money away and God can do what he wants to do in that place because he did what he said. A couple of more and we'll basically be done for this morning. And I'm glad you picked up on that. You may not, this may be the first time you ever saw that, that Abraham laughed and in the next chapter Sarah laughed. She was just doing what faith did. And over in 1 Peter, he commends Sarah for that moment when she calls him Lord and he commends her. Well, why is he commending her? Because she could have said, you know, not for anything. But in the last chapter, if you had read it and you were paying attention, <laughs> she could have said to the Lord, He's the problem, not me. I am just doing what he did. And she doesn't do that. Zip, she says nothing. She will not humiliate her husband because love covers. She will not humiliate him. She won't criticize him. And they don't deal, the Lord doesn't deal with, it, with uh, Sarah. The Lord says to Abraham, why is she laughing? And by the way, for those of you who are, you know, you like the promises and the, pro the prophetic and all that, you notice that Isaac is born exactly as Abraham said, not the Lord. In other words, when you go back and you read it, Abraham, who's 99, says, shall I at 100 years old? He could have picked any number, 120, 150, 200. Shall I, at a hundred years old, have a child? Mm, yeah, that's good. Next year. You just prophesied it, Abraham. You're going to have a kid a year from now, when you're a hundred. These are all these things in the text. When you look at them, a lot of times we, just, we don't get out of it because we're not looking for it, basically. Depends what we're looking for. 
why don't we do this? Why don't you read Job, the first chapter, verses 6 and 7 first? You guys have read this before, but it might hit you a little bit differently in the context of the things we're talking about. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Yeah, making lives miserable. I've been down there making my life spell. You, These little human beings, they are so easily influenced. I cannot believe it. You've given them a planet. You've given them everything. You've given them health. You've given them everything they could possibly want. And they're still listening to me, as God said. They're still, lent. where are you coming from? From harassing mankind. That's what I do. Of God, of men. You Satan, you savor the things of men. Of course I do. They're the easiest things on the planet to destroy and the things you love the most. Chapter 38. First read verse 4, and then drop down to 19 through 21. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Now we know that that's at the end of the story of Job after we've gone through, you know, Job's friends giving him every wrong reason on the planet for why he's going through what he's going through. Throwing shame and humiliation on him. You must be a real work if God's doing this to you. I mean, the whole thing. It's an awful, awful account of why we suffer. God finally gets involved in the conversation in chapter 38. And what is the question he asks? Where were you? You know how I always heard that? I always heard it, Mike, like our dad or something. Say, like, okay, so where were you when I did this? I don't believe that he is insulting Job and that he's shaming him. I do believe what he's asking him, based on what you believe, where were you when I laid the foundation? Where were you? And that would be a good time to say, I was in your heart. Yes, you were. And you didn't know what I was doing. But that's where you were. You were in me. He's trying to draw him back to a place, not humiliate him. I don't believe it. And I'll tell you why. Let's go on. Or chapter 38. Would you read verses 19 through 21? Where is the way to the dwelling of light? In darkness, where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the paths to its home. You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. See, he's continuing to ask him where. And they're all of God. They're in you, God. They're in you, Lord. They're in you, Lord. It's like, it's like that Ezekiel question. Can these bones live? Only you know. I'm not even going to say yes or no. Only you know. It's of God. It's in you. It's of you, Lord. What he's saying to him, he's presenting the situation to him that none of us can answer in the context of what we think he's asking. He's only saying, he's, he's demonstrating and saying all, all these things about himself. When he says, you know, where were you and the whole thing? And he says, but you were born then. That opens up, what? You were there, you were born then. But you are not aware of the of God. You're operating out of the number of your days. And therefore, these questions are all of men questions that you can't answer. There's a challenge right there with Job, and not in a mean way. He's revealing to Job. It was just this last week. This is not like something that I've thought for years. It's this last week I'm reading it, and I'm, I'm thinking, oh God, I have read this so wrong. You weren't shaming him. You never shame us. You never challenge us in that way. You're always asking the kind of questions that we should be asking ourselves. Where was I? Where have I come from? Of God, of the Father. Isaiah has tons of wheres, because we're looking at the word where. He has tons of them. The last one is how he, how he concludes his book. Heaven is my throne, God, this is God speaking. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house? that you will build me. That would be a really good time to say, no man can build you a house. The very best I'm going to do is offer you this one and let you build it. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? 
the temple. Ultimately, it's in Isaiah that these are the two verses that I think are ultimately the best verses that Philip could have quoted that he didn't, and that's not picking on him. He's a good man. He's a very good man, Philip. But where can we go to buy bread for these people? Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come. Buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. There's some uh, good verses in Malachi as the Old Testament ends. Obviously, we've been in the Old Testament all morning uh, that conclude in Malachi that are a bit heart-wrenching, actually. In Malachi, the first chapter, verse 6, and then in the second chapter, verse 17. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. That's heart-wrenching, isn't it? That's point blank, God saying, where is the honor? I mean... You call me Father, but where is the honor in that thing? You call me Lord, where is the honor in that? Even the of men honor their fathers and their masters. Where's mine? In the next chapter, Mike, would you read verse 17? You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? Yeah, well, he says, you know, you've wearied the Lord because you actually, the things that you call good that are not good, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of you ascribing godly qualities that should not be ascribed to bad things. You've wearied the Lord, but it's the next one that concerns me even more. Although I do think basically the world is totally screwed up calling good evil and evil good. I think that's a real mess in the world today. The thing that's more concerning to me when he says you've wearied me is because you cry out, where is the God of justice? And unfortunately, I think a lot of times we do that. We see something with our eyes, we see something, or we hear something. We say, where is God in this? And he's tired of it. He's tired of being called out on every single thing that we've done of man. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it's like, so where is God in all of this? Now, we know that not, God never grows weird. We understand that. But we're talking in poetic terms that God's just saying, I've had it with that. I've had it with calling me into account for the misery that you guys inflict on each other. That I've been trying to call you to the right tree since the beginning. But you know better, you know better. And you're working from a faith that you work from. You believe it works this way where there's no grace. Where you don't really care about your brother. You know, this whole thing. And that's it. Malachi ends and there's 400 years of silence. God's not talking until Jesus appears, the Son of Man, who, is who we're talking about today. We've said before that John's, in the Gospel of John, he has like his code words and stuff, and where is one of them? We've talked about that before. Where for John is always about the Father. In John 2, they didn't know where the wine had come from when he turned the water to wine. They didn't know where it came from. In John 3, the, the wind blows where it will, and you don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. That's a perfect description, but he says, so it is with the people of God. What is that saying? That our origins should be of God, we move in a way that's of God, and return to of God, so it is with people that are born of the Spirit. We've got people, I know people, 
that, you know, I'm just following the leading of the spirit and their eyes are glazed back and they're, you know, they look like they belong in an institution someplace. And that is just not what a Christian walk is about. If it is, somebody should probably tell every great man and woman of God over the last 5,000 years, because you don't see that. What you see them doing is being in a place of trust, confidence, hope, faith. Of course, we make mistakes. We keep sliding into humanity all the time, you know. But for the most part, these are the people of God. This is what God is doing. And you can see it, and you can taste it, and it's very real, the whole thing. The people of God don't really know where they came from. And we talked this morning about, you know, from Job, that we are before the foundations of the world. That's what we're told. We say, I wish I could remember that. But don't worry about it. Get on with the present, what you're doing right now, and you're going to return. You know, so just don't worry about it. You don't even know, don't worry about it. Just leave it. And don't worry about over here. Walk here out of prayer and faith. Walk that thing out is what Jesus is saying. The woman at the well, she did, you know, where are you going to get the living water from? This word where, Jesus in John 14, you know, you don't know where, you know, or you know where I'm going and how to get there. And, you know, Thomas says, we don't know where. Like, that's amazing. How could you not know the Father? I've said it a zillion times. The Father's in me. I'm in the Father. I and my Father are one. It's not I who says this. The Father says it. I don't get my... He goes on and on. How can you say you don't know where? What is the problem with the where? It's the Father. Anyway, this whole thing about where today becomes a very important question for us because at any given moment we can ask ourselves, where am I at? Am I of God and, and from that place and the whole thing? Or am I of man at any given moment? It's very clear, to be honest with you, if we're willing to ask our own, the question to ourselves, where? There was one clue in this whole thing that kind of, I'm not picking on Philip, but it should have been a little bit of a, a clue to Philip. In verse 5, when it says, Jesus lifted up his eyes. That could mean a physical description, although I don't believe it does, but it could, it could be a physical description that he actually looked up towards heaven and said, where are we going to get bread? Might be a good time to go. Where did the manna come from? Dropped out of the sky. Oh, I think we're onto something here. I think it's going to come out of the sky like it did in Moses' day. He doesn't say that. But it says he lift up his eyes, and it's the, the, the Greek and the whole st structure of the sentence is kind of interesting, and nobody ever takes issue with it. But he says he lifted up his eyes and asked Philip. Well, sir, surely Philip wasn't flying over the mountaintop someplace. He's talking to Philip, but he's lifted up his eyes. He's already looked to the source. He's already looked to the mountains from, where's, from whence his help comes from. He's already looked in the right direction. He lifted up his eyes, for he knew what he was going to do. He's already of God. He's in the of God place. He's ticking over in the of God place. Philip and everybody else is in the of man place. Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water, and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. If you throw that into our mix today, Tiberius stinks. Let's get to the other side. <laughs> We've got to get into the things of God here. I'm suffocating here in the things of men. Let's go to the other side. The 
process of getting to the other side, a, a storm comes up. These guys do not respond as men of God. They respond of men. So the bottom line for Jesus, once he deals with what's making them afraid, when he deals with the storm, he then says, where is your faith? And it's not like, for crying out loud, where is your faith? For What is your problem? Don't you get it? It's not like that at all. And I am so convinced that we misread Jesus, the Bible, the whole thing, so much. And if we were coming out of an of God place, all of a sudden we hear the Spirit saying something entirely different in love, in patience, in kindness, in goodness, just like we always try to be with our children, that we many times make mistakes and respond more like of man. But our desire is to be of God that way. I know it is. All of us. So when he says, where is your faith? So if you've been listening to me, maybe you don't rebuke storms, but you're not afraid during them either because I'm in your boat. Where is your faith? As long as he's in the boat, we're fine. We don't have anything to worry about. See, so the whole thing, all these different, where, where are you, you know, where is your brother, where is Sarah, you know, where were you when I, you know, what? all these different wheres. The bottom line becomes, if you are not in that place of prayer and communion with God, if you think you can skip it or it doesn't matter, then when the storms come, you freak out. Instead of when we're in that place, he's the one that said, we've got to make our way from Tiberias to get, we, we've got to get through this thing and get rid of the of man thing, become the new humanity, etc., and get on with the boat ride because there's a long ride ahead. Let's get to the other side. What does that mean? It's a matter of faith. Where is your faith? It's in you, Lord.